All right, welcome back to what is genu genuinely, uh, the, I mean, again, like I could have gone to the gym or whatever, um, but I think this is a pretty good choice. So um, I'm continuing to the uh, Automate Your Network um, series. Uh, I mean, it's 104, so how good of a choice is it to get heat stroke? But at the same time, you know, I'm not gonna get heat, heat stroke. I'm gonna get a great workout, but, um, yeah so anyway I, I, I can do that after it's only uh 4 15 and then and then it'll may hopefully cool off um but uh yeah so uh last uh video i kind of went off on a tangent i'm trying not to do that for this one that was kind of awful um so i'm just going to dive right into it we're uh uh still in chapter one um so we're at the converting configurations to code section the goal is to transform the network from a series of interconnected but unrelated and independently configured devices to a holistic application-like system. Start by collecting relevant data from the existing network, abstract meaningful data from the configurations, and then convert that data into a model. The network should follow a standard core distrib distribution and access layer architecture. A solid IP address plan should already exist, and the network should follow some basic conventions and standards. And what happens if it doesn't do that? This book doesn't say, uh, which is another reason why <laughs> I'm skeptical of automation sometimes. If the network is built on these foundations, which is oftentimes a big if, converting it to code should be quite simple. And not only that, <laughs> Uh, what foundations are you talking about? Like, you know, there are networks that legitimately, you know, you know, this is this is a Cisco book from Cisco. Like, okay, well, what about like a Juniper network that uses SRXs at the edge, and it's layer three all throughout the network, and your access layer, you know, doesn't have VLANs, or it's like it, it's it's totally different or like you're using some special device, like, you know, it's maybe like some comp first principle style company where they write their own gear. It's like, you know, but anyway, keep on going. It should be noted that if, yeah, okay, perfect. I love this book because it talks about this stuff. It should be noted that if the network is chaotic in nature and lacks basic standards, it may be easier to start from scratch and approach it as a greenfield. So greenfield uh, means um, you're adding, if greenfield basically main, means there's no existing network and you're building one. Uh, brownfield means there's an existing network and whether you're adding, removing or modifying devices, you have to do it um, in, in a brownfield. You have to do it without affecting those other devices in a negative way. So like greenfield, you don't have to worry about that because it's, it's all, um, you know, it's all new. Greenfield means everything's new. Brownfield means there's an existing network that you need to uh, work with. So standards and conventions can be enforced using automation. Start by developing models and templates and address the lack of standards on the network as a starting point. Remember garbage in garbage aisle. And you know, this is why I talked about with like, John Henry's too is like he's telling you to be a CCIE network um, architect. <laughs> there is a CCIE network architect already, probably. It's like, you know, there's a reason a network would be like this. So, like, for him to just say, you know, hey, come in with a with standards and conventions and, and, uh, build it as if it were a green field it's like good luck like you know you have to be the director you have to be the c the cio the ceo like it's it, just so much it, almost like arrogance where it's like oh this this network isn't any good for automation well let's rebuild the whole thing and it's, it's like the, the network's probably like that for a reason and like, okay, great, rebuild the whole network from the ground up. How, how long is that gonna take you? A day, a few hours? No, it's gonna take you weeks and months. 
So like, and then the other thing is like, that's a whole nother skill set. You, you have to like, it, this is like presupposing that you have a CCIE in design and in, um, you know, well, design should probably do it, but like, you know, that you're, you're experienced and knowledgeable when it comes to ISP networks, when it comes to enterprise networks, when it comes to data center networks, because this automation isn't just, this book is, is about enterprise networks, but those aren't the only networks that exist and that need to be automated. Anyway, I could go on and get completely off track like I did in the last video, but let's just keep going. If the network is relatively standardized, which is a big F, collect the running configurations from the core, a distribution switch, and an access switch. Try to find devices that represent a standard deployment that can be modeled after and templated from. Extract and separate the important information from the configuration commands. The important information will become variables that go into data models and the configuration commands will go into templates. Meaningful data can include standard global configuration information. So, so this is actually pretty good because regardless of what uh, device you're on, a Juniper, a Cisco, an Aruba, a Arista, the, the Mellanox, a Dell, a Telco, a... Uh, <laughs> Uh, an extreme, a, uh, uh, oh, I'm surely I can think of some more. Um, an Alcatel Lucent, uh, a, uh, oh, surely I can think of some more than that. Um, I mean, like different kinds of devices too, like for like firewalls and stuff, you're probably still going to have logging, SNMP, QoS. Triple A NTP. So if you got your Palo Altos, you got your Fortinets, you got your Cisco firewalls. All right. So standard global configuration information for all kinds of devices and all kinds of manufacturers is Triple A information, QoS policies, SNMP information, logging information, NTP information, and archive information. Um, the other standard uh, thing you'll see is host names, VLAN information, uh, switched virtual interface information for uh, layer three switches, virtual routing and forwarding information for, for routers with multiple routing tables on them, uh, then uh, routing uh, information from the, from the routing tables, um, the default gateway if it's a layer two device, um, access control lists, uh, that's something you'll see on basically every device, regardless of device type of device vendor, probably, especially when it comes to uh, control plane policing. Um, and then uh, physical and virtual interface standards. So for example, VLAN, an IP address, a voice VLAN, uh, spanning tree toolkit settings, power over ethernet, PoE settings, QoS settings, 802.1x or port security settings, trunk or access port settings. All right, so data models. Data models are structured human readable intent-based text files. Data models are also known as data dictionaries and hold the variables leveraged by dynamic templates. These models become the source of truth and network devices are configured to a desired state based on intent network or sorry data models are written in yaml format for the most part key pair values and lists make up a data model there will be both group and host variables that apply to a collection of devices or an individual device on the network modeling data is a key component of network automation and considerable time and care should be spent creating them. It is not uncommon to refactor a model multiple times before the most effective way to handle data that can scale is found. Here is a sample data model in YAML format for a campus access switch. So uh, this is in YAML format. Uh, so we've got the uh, three uh, dashes 
um, and then we've got uh, we don't have any curly braces or, or quotes or any we, well we have quotes here um, oh that's interesting we have quotes here and then we have non quotes here um, so uh, yeah this is a YAML format okay so templates templates are human readable Jinja 2 files made up of logical operators, dynamic variables, and static text. Once combined with group and host variables, each device receives a unique configuration derived from and based on the dynamic templates. The spacing of the text syntax and unique platform variations of text all need to match a device's running configuration. Templates ensure that intentions are defined and that golden configurations on all devices adhere to the standards. Here is a sample template in the Jinja 2 format to configure VLANs on a device. Um, so, so here's a template. Uh, now this is Jinja 2. So uh, I'm, I'm f very familiar with Jinja 2. Jinja 2 can have conditionals in it, which is really useful. Um, now there's something you need to know about Jinja 2 and that's um, when you have like a conditional some of the times, and um, sometimes what it does is it takes out the conditional and it, it, it doesn't, um, like it doesn't delete the line. So like, so like the end result of this here, let me, let me show you. So if I, if I go to my, uh, my tabs here, or let me, let me um, open a new text file, uh, paste this in. Oops. Oh no, I can't. Um, oh, that's a problem. Uh, let's see here. So in Visual Studio, how can I copy text from a PDF and paste it into a new file? In Visual Studio, copying text from a PDF and pasting it into a new file involves a few simple steps. Open the PDF. First, you'll need to open the PDF file from which you want to copy text. You can use any PDF reader, such as Adobe Acrobat Reader or Foxit Reader, for this purpose. Select and copy. All right, let's try using uh, Control C. Okay, yeah. Sometimes, like the the menu is like it doesn't work as well as just control C. Like sometimes if you think it's broken, you can just use control C and it's not broken. But anyways, here, here's um, what I want to say. So sometimes uh, you'll have it so that, um, okay, great. We go through the whole thing. Uh, the native VLAN is 99. Um, uh, we go through this, there's only one in the list. So the host VLAN is, is uh, VLAN uh, 10. And then uh, the name of the VLAN is uh, VLAN underscore 10. And uh, all of this uh, logic has gone through, everything's good. So what happens in the final result? Sometimes is that, and you get this sloppy, disgusting thing on your device that has all these extra lines and looks weird um so now there's a way there's a way to guarantee you don't get that like like this this is actually like one of the main reasons like i've i just like wouldn't use uh i just wouldn't use jinja 2 because it's like there's so much like where it's like it's just not doing it like the way i want it to and like if i just use a python dictionary like and I'm like really the only developer on it anyways it's like it does what I want it to do in an intuitive way that I want to do it um because like I just I just don't believe in necessarily like having the code uh be um like what words do they use they use use the words um so like you know I, I like code like human readable code 
Like, I, like, first of all, is this really human readable? Like, is anyone going to tell me that this is human readable code? Like, this is, this is not human readable. Like, yes, the um, YAML, like, this is a lot more human readable than, like, JSON. But, like, you know, what is human readable? Like, if we're, if we're saying YAML is more human readable than JSON because it doesn't have curly brackets everywhere, well, we've got all our curly brackets back now, and now this is human readable, but the JSON is not. So it's like, you, you know, what, human readable isn't a real thing. Like humans read code, humans code in C, humans speak Chinese, they speak Russian, like things that you wouldn't think are human readable are things that millions and billions of people all over the world read every day of humans. So it's like, you know, by the definition of human readable, this is not human readable. Um, this, uh, I guess is more human readable than JSON, but who says that JSON is not human readable people, as I said, you know, read Chinese, people read Russian, people read English. It's like, there's no such thing as something that's human readable and human not readable. It's like, and then it, it depends so much on the times too. It's like, you know, the only reason this looks clean is because, you know, it's it's the standard. Like, it's what we're all looking at all the time. So, like, that's kind of my reasoning. This is kind of a tangent, but, like, sometimes I would just not use Jinja 2. I would just use the Python dictionaries because Python dictionaries, for me as a developer reading Python dictionaries as a human reading Python dictionaries all day was more human readable than, you know, this sloppy syntax, especially with, when it comes to the conditionals. I mean, here, here, let me, let me really drive this point home here. So I'm going to open a new file. And it's going to be a Python file. And now what we're going to do is uh, we're going to take uh, th this here um, paste it in, um, put it in uh, quotes so it's just a comment. And now what we're going to do is uh, rewrite uh, this statement here um, f in, in actual Python. So it's going to be like if host VLANs, so like that would be the same as like if is the fine because like if if it's not it'll be a none type um so then then we can do if host vlans um now we can do for host vlan in host vlans we can do uh um print uh Oh, I need this menu to go away. I I can't handle this menu. It has to go away. Um, okay, so we can do print uh, and then an f string, and we can do uh, VLAN. Uh, and look, we only need one. We only we don't even need two brackets now. We don't need to put it in a space. You know, tell me, like, you know, Python is designed to be human readable too. So like, which one is more readable? Is is this more readable? Um, and you know what? We're done. We don't need any of these. We're done here. Is this three lines of code with uh, fewer squiggly brackets, with no percent signs, and with no uh, and with white space used to determine whether the for and the if statement are complete or not? Is that more readable, or is that less readable than this? So it's like, this is where I get, this is where it's like, you know, it's just, I get so frustrated and upset with this sort of stuff where it's like, you know, it's, it's just like, I feel like, a I feel like I'm being tortured. Like I honestly, like, you know, I, I've lost a lot of my hair <laughs> uh, and this might be why, because it's like, 
this is half the number of lines. It's it's probably half the number of special characters. Um, and uh, I guess it's not as human readable as this is. So it's like, what are we even talking about? Like, this is absurd. So a lot of the times in my code, what I'd like to do is um, just f not use Jinja 2 because again, what is more readable, this or this? And then, okay, okay, well, maybe some of the, you know, maybe host VLANs, you, you know, and you're still, you know, you're, you're still drawing in host VLANs for this. So it's like, you know, conditionals, for loops, um, print statements. It's Python. Python is made to be human readable. So like, this is this is for producing like more complex strings. Yes. So like, you know, the print statements might actually be a little bit better. Yeah, but like, and this this is what got me too, and why I would not do this is because, you know, this dot syntax. It's like, what is, like, it's confusing, and like, it doesn't have to be. Like, we're all we're all Python programmers here. Like, why do we have to be Jinja programmers as well? Like, especially when, like, it just it's just confuse it's just confusing. Like, sure, sometimes it looks a little bit cleaner, but you know, as I showed, sometimes it doesn't. So why don't we just use one thing and simplify everything? But the answer to that is because sometimes string manipulation can be uh, complicated um, enough so that using Jinja2 makes sense. I haven't necessarily seen times where it absolutely makes sense. I've seen times where <sighs> you know, it kind of makes sense to placate people who don't like looking at Python, but from a developer standpoint, I haven't really seen it make sense. All right, so, but that's just my experience. Of course, I could be really embarrassed and doing everything wrong, and uh, that is probably the case. Okay, so um, there we go. Uh, we talked about uh, why Jinja2 um, is like being tortured. And then we're moving on to methodology. Some of the biggest changes that network automation brings is the new methodology available now that the network has become application-like and is comprised of standard human readable code. Instead of network engineers drafting configuration changes and network operations deploying to production at the CLI, they can follow a CI slash CD pipeline with change management version control and a branching strategy. Um, documentation will move to TFS as it becomes automated along with the configurations of the devices. Reviewing pull requests and git commits will be part of the routine for network engineers as they review and approve changes to the master branch. The SDLC approach to software development should already exist <laughs> <laughs> in the uh, organization. <laughs> oh my God, that's hilarious. Um, I don't even know what this is. Uh, so what? what is the SDLC approach to software development? The Software Development Lifecycle, SDLC, is a process used by software developers and project managers to design, develop, test, and deploy software systems. The SDLC approach provides a structured framework for the production of high-quality software. Let's go through its primary phases. Requirements gathering. This is the initial stage where developers, stakeholders, and users meet to define the software specifications. Understanding the requirements is crucial for delivering a product that meets expectations. Feasibility study. In this phase, the feasibility of the software solution is assessed in terms of technical, operational, and financial aspects. System design. The system and software design is prepared from the specification documents. Two main types of design happen here. High-level design. Defines the architecture of the software. Low-level design. Defines the data flow and control flow. Coding. The actual code for the system is written during this stage. Programming languages, database, and tools are chosen that are suitable for the project. Testing. The system is tested to find defects and ensure that it is working as per the specifications. 
Deployment. After successful testing, the software is deployed to the target environment. Maintenance. Post deployment, the software may require updates, enhancements, bug fixes, etc., which is handled in the maintenance phase. Now, considering your upcoming job interview, knowledge of the SDLC can often be critical. You may be right. asked questions about. Job interview is over, so I'm just going to. Sorry, I should probably do this off the stream, but um, I'm going to uh, update this. Okay, so. Um, I have multiple major goals in life. The first major goal is to find a 100% remote, high paying job that allows me to uh, grow in my career by mastering a niche such as network automation and that gives me a bird's eye view of the industry <coughs> where I can see I can see across see many networks and where I can see many networks and quickly know how how well the network is designed and how cutting edge and and how cutting edge the technology and and how um how well the network is designed and how um expert level how experts in my field think. So I have multiple major goals in life. The first uh, major goal is to find a 100% remote high paying job that allows me to grow in my career by mastering a niche such as network automation. And that gives me a bird's eye view of the industry where I see, where I can see many networks and quickly know how well the network is designed. Um, uh, signed. Yeah, I'm I'm happy with that. My second major goal is to pass the Encore exam in September. Um, to do this, I need to work through at least 30 new Anki flashcards per day. My third major goal is to pass the LPIC-1 exam as part of a larger goal of revamping my set of skills to make me more valuable and eligible for 100% remote uh, work jobs. Um, then my fourth major goal, oh, I'm sure I'm forgetting stuff. Uh, my fourth major goal is to finish uh, reading the book Automate Your Network for my YouTube channel. My fifth major goal is to 
start producing mentorship content on my YouTube channel. Yeah, so like right all which will include live inter live uh, uh, coaching and mentorship sessions with volunteers um, tears using uh, the uh, engineer kit methods <laughs> all right so so I would like ChatGPT to constantly reminding me of goals and to interject useful information in candor that will help me achieve them um, especially important I would like GPT to make sure that I have completed my Anki for today um, uh, always think out loud show your work and explain your reasoning Ex aim to make me a smarter person who doesn't struggle to accomplish goals nor struggle to set and define the goals uh, which are best uh, make sure that your that chat GPT always is directing me to work towards uh, a skill set that is most valuable for uh, work that can be performed remotely remotely so that I can achieve my number one goal in life and my career which is to not have to work uh, in an office okay that's pretty happy all right there we go so um yep so we learned what that is sorry that was kind of a diversion there but i needed to do that so the sdlc approach to software development should already exist in the organization um, should is a big word there an opportunity exists to bridge it with software development which adopts already existing code standards and development policies for the new network automation code initially network engineers will write ansible playbooks that operations will execute as a one line command at an approved uh, schedule. Uh, eventually, these steps become automated through the CI CD pipeline. So, th so this idea of a one one um, line command that's actually a a, a big thing because, like, you know, a lot of the times these engineers will will sit down and do this, do that, do the other thing, and you know, you can make it so that like they just do ten things with one command, and it's like you're not. <laughs> you're not doing any risk you're not doing anything it's like all you're doing is just taking away point and click and like people will appreciate that like that's that's universally seen as a good thing um in my mind i mean sometimes you know like hiding what you're doing behind a command is kind of annoying but like you know a lot of times it is not and a lot of times you know as i mentioned you are dealing with John Henry's that are better than you so they will probably have their own bash scripts and have it um, macro to one command anyway all right so network development lifecycle NDLC a network development lifestyle can be adopted to help provide a high-level vision and guidance around network development a framework for the branch structure is required Developers need to perform get commits frequently, checking in their code often. A common data model format needs to be followed uniformly by all developers. Naming conventions established, which is hard. Standardized templates and programmatic code formats developed. Code should include comments. A formalized pull request structure, including documentation, 
specific testing requirements, and an overall approval process is the foundation for merging code from development into production. Create the build CI and release CD pipeline structure. Small feature releases and pre-approved changes can be merged into the master branch quickly and easily. The code change will be delivered automatically when the next scheduled release occurs. Disruptive changes, larger changes, and major feature releases should all require approvals and be scheduled in advance, especially larger one-time releases. Schedule these changes outside of the regular release cycle depending on urgency. Many traditional NDLCs, which we remember stands for Network Development Lifestyles, directly translate to network automation code development strategies. The prepare, plan, design, implement, operate, optimize, PPDIOO methodology from Cisco, for example, fits nicely or nicely fits the network automation vision laid out in this book. So this is the methodology uh, from Cisco. Um, so many traditions. Okay, so so th this is this is a network development uh, life cycle, and a network development life cycle can be adopted to help provide a high level vision and guidance around network development. So what we're talking about in network development in this case isn't necessarily writing code. Um, we're also talking about like you know the the old school approach because like you know they had to design and implement networks before things were automated and before code was being used so they had to do that in a specific way and um it looks like the way they used to do that was um via methodology from cisco on some networks so cisco actually had uh, already a form of a network development life cycle um, but um, it's not one where you would use code. It's one where you would use whatever legacy approaches were used uh, before um, the techniques in this book were developed. So even even before they were trying to create intent-based configuration and um, have the network run like a software development, uh, they had a methodology from Cisco that was prepare, plan, design, implement, operate, and optimize. That actually kind of set the set it up for um, network automation code development. So this is a traditional uh, network development lifecycle that directly translates to modern network development uh, lifecycles based in code. And it, what it is, is prepare, plan, design, implement, operate, and optimize. Okay, so uh, the PPD IOO methodology from Cisco, for example, nicely fits the network automation vision laid out in this book. The same lifecycle approach to network infrastructure should be applied to the new network automation code. The first exam, the first steps, prepare, plan, design, uh, so we've got we've got six steps here, so you could split them into two. So the first uh, three steps are prepare, plan, and design, and they're performed in VS Code while Ansible is used to perform the next uh, set of three steps: the uh, implement and the operate. Uh, oh, the next the next two steps of the remaining three steps. So that's the implement and operate steps, and then refactoring code can be considered the optimization optimization stage of the life cycle. So for more on PPD IOO, um, here we go. Let's let's actually take a look at that. Um, and I noticed it's uh, HTTP, not HTTPS. So I'm not sure if this is still a valid link. Oh, you know what it is. Okay, great. Um, now this is talking about, okay, sweet. It's not it's not even in a book. Um, let's let's ask the AI and let's see how close um, uh, this is. So explain to me the. So. Explain to me the. Oh, never mind. Okay. So, um, uh, let me just refresh this. Okay. So, 
explain the yes understanding it will give you a bird's eye view of the industry and aspect you're aiming for and may contribute to network automation skills you can master what is ppdio ppdio stands for prepare plan design implement operate and optimize it is a model used to provide a comprehensive approach to network design which aids in constructing scalable reliable and manageable networks prepare in this phase you identify business requirements and translate these into technical requirements this involves discussions with stakeholders, assessment of current resources, and a high-level estimate of the budget and ROI, return on investment. Plan the plan phase involves identifying the network requirements based on goals, facilities, and user needs. This phase should cover logical design, scope, and project plan, involving things like an initial network topology and necessary hardware and software. Design here you delve deep into the technical aspects. This includes selecting technologies and devices, creating detailed designs, and documenting them. A good design focuses on scalability, availability, and security, among other things. Implement during this phase, network components are deployed based on the design specifications. This should be done in a manner that minimizes impact on the existing setup and optimizes uptime. It often involves testing and rollout plan to mitigate risks. Operate after implementation, the focus shifts to maintaining the network. This involves monitoring performance, fault identification, troubleshooting, and necessary updates. Network automation tools can be particularly useful here for routine tasks. Optimize the final stage revolves around proactive network management. This involves tweaking the existing setup for better performance and efficiency, often driven by feedback and metrics collected during the operate phase. How does PPDIO relate to your goals? Network automation. Mastering the PPDIO cycle will deepen your understanding of what can be automated and how, which is beneficial for your niche and network automation. Encore exam. Understanding PPDIO might appear in the Encore exam. You can even make some monkey flashcards about the PPDIO phases and their key activities. Remote work. Many of the tasks in the PPDIO lifecycle can be performed remotely, especially if you specialize in network automation tools that help in implementing, operating, and optimizing networks. All right, so that's, I'm pretty happy with that. Okay, so, um, yeah, so, so moving on. Um, yeah, okay, we, we've got the, link um up there um i might want to save that actually so we're gonna say uh that it's uh page 23 and then uh we're gonna save this link or we'll just we'll do it from here Okay, and then we'll say um, PPDIOO. Okay, perfect. And then we'll go to here, we'll stage the change, and then we'll uh, commit the change. So we're going to say uh, saving a link to Cisco PPDIOO. Okay, and then we'll sync the changes. Uh, no, I would not like to do that because it will overwrite what I've got. Um, okay. Okay, so um, there we go. Um, all right, now moving on. All right, so Ansible. Ansible was written by Michael uh, D. Hahn and uh, developed by the Ansible uh, community. Let's take a look at Michael D. Hahn quick. Uh, uh, looks like Michael D. Hahn has a uh, um, LinkedIn account. Um, I don't know, it, like it doesn't matter to see Michael DeHaan's photo. I guess I guess what really matters is uh, to look at his um, uh, LinkedIn and maybe even like follow him on LinkedIn because he might say some interesting things. Um, yeah, he's talking a lot about like Terraform and stuff, which is like I think pretty useful for me. And, and look at this. This is cool too. He's got a LS, LLC just named after his name. So like you know, I um, have an LLC named after my name. So yeah, just like knowing what this guy do is doing is like pretty useful, I think. Uh, knowing his background too, yeah, BS in computer science, that's um, one thing I don't have. Maybe a reason why he's uh, more successful than I am, uh, presumably. Maybe he's not, but kind of assume that he is. Um, so yeah, th this is a great follow. So I'm going to follow him and move on. All right. So, and it's developed by the Ansible community. Ansible Inc. and Red Hat Inc. initially released on February 20th, 2012. 
Ansible's latest stable version as of the writing of this book is 2.7.0. According to the Ansible white paper, Ansible in depth, the design goals for Ansible were minimal in nature, consistent, secure, highly reliable, minimal learning required. So here's the white paper for Ansible. Plug that in. Okay, that is an actual HTTPS. Um, so here's the white paper. I, need, I guess you need to log in in order to read it, to download it. Uh, so another important distinguishing feature is that Ansible is agentless. SSH is used to connect Ansible to network devices. Nothing requires configuration on the devices aside from standard CLI access and possibly a service account when using RSA or other forms of AAA authentication on the network. Aside from Ansible needing to log in to the device, there are no other requirements to the network. Ansible is also cross platform across Linux, Windows, Unix, uh, F5, big dash IP, and Cisco network devices. Um, uh, I don't see Juniper on there. Uh, Ansible by Red Hat is the open source version and Red Hat Ansible Engine is the commercially available version. Ansible is an automation engine that runs playbooks written in YAML format. Tasks are executed serially and offer full orchestration control within a playbook. Uh, so here's the Ansible framework. So think of Ansible more as an automation framework rather than a programming language. Ansible is not C++ nor Java for networks, um, which is why I personally, <laughs> but rather a framework of tools made up of the following. So Ansible is not a Turing complete uh, <laughs> program that you can use to accomplish anything on your network, it is Ansible. And it's made up of the following. Inventory, static host.ini file, um, possibly dynamic using API calls from, from NMS, IPAM, or inventory system already maintained with a list of network devices, uh, variables, uh, group underscore vars, host underscore vars, YAML format, data models for network devices as a group and as individual devices, uh, playbooks, uh, YAML file format, serial execution of tasks, calls Ansible modules, templates, uh, Jinja2 file format, dynamic calls to the variables at playbook runtime, mix of static text, simple logic, if, if else for variables, plugins, uh, Python format, extended base capabilities, of core Ansible engine, custom written modules, Python and PowerShell format, vendor specific modules for communicating with devices. Okay, uh, next is Python. So Python is a powerful, easy to learn open source programming language and is the foundation for Ansible written by Guido von Rosum and released in 1991. Python has a design philosophy of readability. So apparently we should use Jinja2 um, for more readability. The Ansible repository is available at uh, GitHub and it is possible to contribute to the community project. While it is not necessary to understand the Python code Ansible is written in, um, it is possible to write Ansible plugins using Python or contribute code to the Ansible project once Python is well understood. All right, so the next one is uh, YAML. I'm sure we'll get to, like, yeah, chapter six will walk us through, like, installing Ansible. So let's keep on reading and then, you know, worry about it when we get there. So YAML ain't markup language is a human readable data serialization language. So data serialization, that's important. Um, commonly used for configuration. Uh, uh, files. And I'm going to ask the AI, why do we need a data serialization? 
Why do we need data serialization? Data serialization is the process of converting complex data structures like arrays, objects, or data structures into a format that can be easily stored or transmitted and later reconstructed. This process is crucial for several reasons. Portability across systems different systems may have different ways of representing data structures in memory. Serialization provides a standard way of converting these complex structures into a stream of bytes, which can be easily transported between different systems, irrespective of their underlying architecture. Persistent serialized data can be easily saved to a storage medium like a disk for future use. For example, you can serialize your network configurations if you are working on network automation so that these can be applied at a later time or analyzed for optimization. Communication serialization is critical when data needs to be sent over a network. For instance, API calls frequently involve serialized data formats like JSON or XML. If you are aiming for mastery in network automation, understanding serialization formats that are commonly used in RESTful APIs will be highly beneficial. Caching in large-scale systems, data is often cached to improve performance. Serialization allows you to store the cached data in an efficient way, saving both space and computation time during retrieval. Data duplication and consistency serialization can be used to duplicate complex data structures so that they can be consistently reused, which is critical in distributed computing environments. Code reusability and versioning serialized data can include metadata that makes it easier to manage versions of serialized objects. This way, old data can still be readable even if the underlying data structure changes. Optimization Some serialization formats are optimized for speed or size, helping improve the performance of the system. This can be important in network-heavy tasks, which is something you care about as you venture deeper into network automation. All right, so uh, I got another question here. Are there any cases where it doesn't make sense to use data serialization? Certainly, while data serialization is extremely useful for various scenarios, there are instances where its use may be unnecessary, inefficient, or even problematic. Yeah. Here are some such cases. Real-time systems in real-time or low-latency environments where performance is critical, serialization and deserialization can introduce overhead that slows down the system. Oh, wow, okay. In network automation, you'd want real-time statistics and updates. Serialization could slow down these processes. See, see, that's what I mean. It's like, you know, I've not, I've done it where, like, I haven't used serialization. And it's like, yeah, because I was collecting real-time statistics and updates. So, I, I, like, I'm so glad I'm reading this book because, like, I feel so validated. Like, until I read this book, I'm like, I'm stupid because I'm not using serialization. Now it's like, no, like, using serialization is not stupid. You're not smarter by using the wrong tool for the job just because the tool is complicated. You're dumber for doing that. So, like, yeah. All right. Well, I feel good. Yeah, this is the thing, too. Like, non-standard. Like, sometimes you just... You're not, it's, it doesn't all fit into a neat box. Yeah, this is too, like you're just doing something quick and simple and it shouldn't, you don't need to use, you know, a jackhammer for just pounding in one nail. All right, I feel good, I feel really good. Okay, so um, it's, it's the language commonly used for configuration files. YAML was created by Clark Evans. Um, so these might be uh, some more good follows on um, on uh, my uh, LinkedIn. So let's look for Car Clark uh, Evans. We'll type in YAML. All right. Uh, so he's probably not even on LinkedIn because he's. Uh, nope. Uh, I think he's on LinkedIn. This is him. This is the YAML guy. Uh, this is the YAML guy, right? No, there's no way. Cause he, yeah, he, he works at Prometheus research. This guy was not, yeah, this guy never worked at Prometheus research. Yeah, this is not the same. Oh no, he did. He did. Yeah, this is him. This is the YAML guy. All right. Well, I guess, uh, yeah, I guess I'll follow him. Um, this is YAML guy. So yeah, I guess I'll follow him. Oh yeah. Yeah. He's in the Python as well. He's got like job interview posts and stuff. Yeah. I'm following the YAML guy. I, I, so there's, there's two more YAML people. Um, so, uh, here's the second one. And it looks like they, um, oh, this was all in 2001. So like, yeah, the guy kind of like, I figured he'd be a, a bit older. Maybe he's just aging really gracefully, but I thought YAML was older than it is. Okay, so here's, yeah, this, I'm sure this is, what has he got, per, Prometheus Research as well. 
Uh, I don't see Prometheus research on here. Um, I mean, that's a unique enough name. Like, I wouldn't be surprised. I mean, this is probably him. It's probably a good follow anyways, even if it's not. All right. And then uh, we're going to follow uh, the um, final uh, designer of YAML. Okay, so this is, um, yeah, we only got one one hit on that. So this is probably him. Um, what we got here, we got uh, Prometheus. No, but we got a lot of software stuff. So, yeah, you know, even if it's not the person I'm looking for, it's probably a good follow. All right, so let's follow uh, this, this person in as well okay and moving on so that's what i love about learning about this stuff too is like this is like all this technology is like living and breathing it's not like when you were in school learning about you know isaac newton it's like these people are you can you could message them and they they'll probably message you back saying stop spamming me you and uh do something better <laughs> all right so uh most of the <laughs> ansible fo no i'm sure I, that, that's i'm sure they're all like super nice and you know this is what i followed four people so like you know if one of them's a giant a-hole like you know that's just one out of the four like in, in my experience like people are mostly nice and like people who aren't nice are like either dealing with some big problem or like they're too like busy to be nice so like you know, if you want to contribute to these, like, that's a great way to uh, to build a career. Because, like, this is living, breathing technologies. Uh, you know, it's if this is the GitHub to YAML. If you want to go and um, pull it down and do a, you know, a, a PR, pull request up to... Oh, this is the wrong thing. But, uh, yeah, I mean, that's that's what I love about learning about technology um in the way I, I am is like it's living and breathing these are all real people that you can not only communicate with that you can collaborate with so most of the ansible files including group and host uh variables tasks and playbooks are written in yaml format vs code has yaml extensions to help write proper yaml code while modeling the network or writing Ansible playbooks. All right, Jinja2. So Jinja2, um, again, on uh, GitHub. Uh, so here's another probably pretty darn good follow. Uh, and this, this is newer, so this is uh, 2008. So it's a full-featured templating engine for uh, Python. Ansible templates will be written in Jinja2 syntax. Templates are made up of a combination of static text, dynamic variables, and programming log logic. All right, so this is the Jinja2 guy. Um, wow, okay. I mean, 2018. Wait, no, so 2008. So this is another guy who's either aging super gracefully or like is way younger than I thought. Um, but uh yeah i mean like 2008 so like you know if that's a grad school and he um did this as part of like phd work or whatever he would have been like what 25 or so and now it's um it's like 15 years later so yeah he could be like you know 30s or so but yeah, this is probably a great follow as well. So I'm going to follow him. And then the other thing is like, you can see what these people are doing. Cause like if they did something so impactful that caught on like, so like, well, you know, like a few decades ago, like if you want to be on the cutting edge and like, you know, be up to date with industry trends, just look at the people who created the industry trends. Uh, Cause they're probably going to be, working on the new ones. 
So yeah, here we go. This is the creator of Flask and uh, the Jinja template engine. Like this guy is a great follow. Um, he works for Sentry IO. Um, so yeah, you know, it's, it's directly connected to uh, jobs as well. Um, a lot of these are you know, T-shaped skills. They're not really specialist jobs. So, like, they want someone with a bachelor's or a master's, or just or just who has like T-shaped skills. Um, there we go about us. Uh, oh, it's just like an error monitoring software. It does like other things. Uh, okay, well. I'm just kind of getting lost. Uh, the point is to, um, to just be following these people because these people are, um, these people are, uh, you know, the people who created the cutting edge. So there's really no reason to think that they are not currently working on the next cutting edge. All right, so uh, Am Armin is a full featured, oh no, he's not, He's Armin is a computer scientist. Jinja 2 is a full featured templating engine for um, Python, Ansible, uh, yeah, so we, we read that all well. Um, templates are made up of a combination of static text, dynamic variables, and programming language. All right, so next is playbooks. Ansible playbooks are written in YAML. Playbooks are executed against devices in the inventory file. For full configuration management, it is required that group variables, host variables, templates, and tasks be developed in addition to the inventory file. To run an Ansible playbook, execute the following command in the Linux host, ansible-playbook, and then the file name of your playbook. And they're written in YAML, so you can see we've got the YAML file extension. Item potency, um, I'm gonna say what I think item potency is because I think I have a good understanding of it. So item potency means it's dependent on the current state. So like, let's say I um, write a, a program that what it does is anytime it sees uh, the color green, it's gonna change it to the color red. So that would be an item potent program because it would see that it's the color red and then it would not try to change it to the color red because it's already the color red. It would only change it to color red if it were the color green. So an example of a program that is not idempotent would be a program that although it is the color red already, it will execute whatever process it uses to change it to color red. It, it does not look at the current state and determine based on the current state whether or not it needs to be in a new state. That's that's the case for something that isn't idempotent. For something that is idempotent, it will do an analysis of the current state to determine whether or not the state needs to be changed. Idempotency is a key feature of Ansible. To be idempotent means the same task can be executed a single or multiple infinite times and the results will always be the same. To say the network is idempotent means the source of truth including the results from the Ansible playbook and the running configuration of the device match when compared. Once idempotent, uh, Ansible playbooks will show the results of the playbook in green text, indicating no changes will be made because the two configurations are identical. If the configurations are not idempotent, the Ansible playbook will show a change in yellow text, reporting a change will be made by the playbook. 
by reaching full coverage of the network configurations and transforming the configurations to code, the master branch becomes a full representation of the network. All future changes become extremely easy to validate using the branching strategy of a working branch per change. These working branches can be executed in check mode. Okay, so uh, we're gonna read about check mode uh, next. This is not at all sounding like what I just said about item potency. So let's check my knowledge using the uh, AI. My understanding of item potency is that, for example, if you had a program where you wanted to check something to determine whether it was green or red, a program that was not item potent would not do the process that it does to change something from green to red. Um, sorry, what I mean is that a program that is item potent would check the current state of the thing it's checking to be green or red. And if the thing is already red, then it won't execute the process that it uses to change the state to red since it's already red but a program that is item that is not item potent would execute that process to change something to red whether it was red or not is this a correct understanding if not then what is wrong with my understanding and what is the correct understanding of item potency It sounds like you're trying to understand the concept of ID impotency in computer science and programming. The term is most commonly used in the context of APIs, databases, and distributed systems to describe operations that can be repeated multiple times without changing the result beyond the initial application. You're on the right track, but let's clarify it a bit. Item potent and item potent operation is one that has the same effect whether it's performed once or multiple times. For example, saying the color to red is item potent because doing it once or doing it ten times in a row will still result in the color being red. Not item potent and not item potent operation, on the other hand, will have different effects if performed more than once. For example, adding 1 to a variable is not item potent because doing it once will increase the variable by 1, but doing it again will increase the variable by another 1, resulting in a different final state. In the context of your example, item potent, if the operation checks the state and only changes it to red if it is not already red, then it is item potent. Running this operation once or many times will result in the state being red. Not item potent. If the operation changes the state to red regardless of its current state, and let's say logs the timestamp or generates an event every time this happens, then it is not item potent. Running it multiple times would generate multiple timestamps for events, which would be different outcomes. Given that you're aiming for a career in network automation and Okay, so I was more or less correct. It's just like my under it's just I wasn't really clarifying it correctly. Like I really like thinking of it as numbers. So a non item potent operation would be incrementing a number because um the final state of your operation will be different every time you run the operation. An item potent uh, operation would be, uh, for example, incrementing that number once. And then if the number has already been incremented, um, no longer incrementing it anymore. The final state of the operation, once complete, uh, will not be altered again even if you initiate that operation again. As long as the change the operation intended to make was made, no further changes will be made. Uh, nine item potent, then um, it will uh, make uh, further changes, uh, which, which kind of like, you know, this is another thing where it's like, do you really want item potent? Like, you know, I, I would say I would want non-item potent because like you know if you're making a lot of changes on the network like you don't want a program that 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 can only make like i feel like it makes sense like yeah you, you don't want a program where you can and there's something i learned about recently which is like drift where like it's if a network configuration doesn't match like the source of truth like it drifted away from it like yeah, if it's drifting through non-item potent operations, then it's going to drift very, very far. But if it's dripping through a drifting through an item potent operation, it'll just drift not quite as far, or it won't drift every single time 
the operation is executed. All right, so I have a better understanding of that now. Uh, let's move on to check mode. Um, Ansible playbooks have a check mode where playbooks can be tested without executing any changes. The combination of item potency and check mode is very powerful. So ideally, uh, make a code change, run code in check mode with verbosity enabled, confirm exact change reflected in output of check mode, run code in execute mode, um, rerun play in check mode to confirm play results are in green indicating no changes will be made and that the automated configuration matches the running configuration. Automating a mistake can arguably lead to a to faster impact on a larger scale than a mistake made manually at the CLI, a single device. For something as potentially dangerous as network automation in such a risk adverse field, check mode offers the ability to perform a dry run of a playbook without making any modifications to the network. Check mode on its own will show hosts in green text indicating no changes would have been made by the Ansible playbook if it was executed. Should changes be found, uh, the hosts with changes will show in yellow text. This indicates Ansible in execute mode would have pushed changes to the device. It also indicates the playbook is not item potent. Results can be documented and included as artifacts in the change management approval process. Stress is reduced and reassurance is offered, further easing the transition to network automation. For all changes that cannot be performed in a lab environment or for large disruptive changes uh, touching many devices, check mode can be used to show the exact commands the playbook will execute serially device by device. So to do that, you do ansible-playbook, then your playbook, notice it's YAML, because playbooks are in YAML, and then dash dash check. Uh, oh, um, differentials too. I'm gonna read about differentials because uh, these, these are actually legitimately like really good features. Uh, Junipers have these kinds of things built into them, but for devices that don't, like using some external configuration management tool like Ansible that has those features, in my opinion, is worth using some sort of external uh, management tool like Ansible that has those features. <laughs> All right, so... Uh, differentials, differentials dash dash diff are another option for Ansible playbooks. Diff is often used in conjunction with check mode. If the Ansible module supports diff, playbooks can be executed with the option to set to compare the automated configuration against the device's configuration. This is useful for before and after comparisons or to fully understand the changes the playbook would have made had it been running in execute mode. So there we go, it's the dash dash diff, or when combined with check mode and verbosity. There we go, you can put them all together. A detailed guide um, check mode uh, dry run is available here. I might wanna save this because uh, this, this is like, you know, as I say in this channel, like the failure doesn't happen when you bring down all of North America by uh, doing a wrong BGP setting. You know, the failure happens because you forgot to use check mode and diff mode um, or check mode and diff mode showed you something would have been wrong. That's where you made the failure is, is you know, it's not, it's not when the thing actually happens. It's, if you fail to check like that, that should be the worst thing failure you can possibly make is failing uh, an advanced check like this. Okay, so check mode is is pretty um, important. Oh, Berlin, I like Berlin. I want to go to Berlin sometime. Berlin sounds fun. They have the uh, Ansible Community Day in Berlin. That sounds like fun, doesn't it? <laughs> um, okay, so 
Yep, so I'm gonna put this in my notes. Um, so there we go. Uh, here's the read through notes here. Um, this is page mode. Use, and then I'll say uh, this is on page 26. And then I'll say use Ansible check and diff modes. Like this, so this would be worth just those modes alone are probably worth getting like really comfortable using Ansible because that brings a lot to an organization when you can have it so that your failures are that it, it didn't pass a check versus it brought down the network for a whole country. <laughs> okay, so um, uh, uh, so use Ansible check and diff modes. Uh, we gotta stage the commit first. Okay, and then uh, now now we do our message and we commit it, and then we sync it. Looks good to me. Okay, so uh, yep, there we go. We've got that saved now. Uh, we're following all the right people. Uh, oh, I closed the wrong file, so I gotta open it again. And it takes me right to where I left off, which is amazing. So, uh, yep, so this is a detailed guide on check mode. Save that to my notes. It's going to be important uh, to know and to use uh, later. We've got quite a few uh, more topics to, to get through. It looks like the summary, it looks like we're almost to chapter two. Yeah, we're almost to chapter two, but uh, I, I'm sure I'm very far, very, very far into the... Uh, let's read about verbosity because it's it's mentioned here. So verbosity, various levels of verbosity can be set when running the playbooks to provide more details in the output from the playbook. When combined with check mode, for example, adding one level of verbosity will show potential changes in yellow text and will also output the exact text of the configurations that would be changed. Deeper levels of verbosity exist providing even more granular output. This is useful for troubleshooting playbooks um, let's let's get up to ansible tower so that i'm cleanly on the next page so tags tags can be added to tasks within a playbook this can help organize group or classify tasks and is very useful for larger playbooks tagged tasks can be run inside a larger playbook conversely it is possible to run all tasks except the tagged tasks um, tasks are a way to provide metadata or sorry, tags are a way to provide metadata and organizational structure to tasks. A detailed guide to Ansible tags are here. A guide to Ansible playbooks are here. So I actually think I wanna save this because I think this is another thing that could be pretty powerful is like, you know, so, uh, Yeah, I, th I think I want to save this. So I'm going to do that. My read through notes. Um, I'm not sure what page this is on, but let's say uh, Ansible tags. All right, so this is on. Uh, page uh, 27 okay so uh, now we've got to stage the change um, and as the staging you might be like I was sometimes and be like that's annoying why do I have to do that well the reason you have to do that is let's say you have a bunch of changes and you you definitely want to change a bunch of files that you've changed and like there's one file was like i need to save this now uh these changes are really important to the other changes i'm still working on then you stage that one file and you commit that one file and you keep working on the other ones so staging is useful because sometimes you don't want to just 
commit and push all of your changes. Sometimes you just want to do it for the changes that are most important to commit now and then keep working on the other ones and commit them later or even just uh, discard all your changes. Okay, so we're going to say Ansible tags. Here's our commit message and then we're going to sync the changes. And I'll probably do the don't show again next time I do that. Okay, so now we're on the Ansible Tower, which is kind of, I think, a, uh, a, pretty, um, a pretty good, clean place to stop. Um, so uh, I'm so tempted to just finish this off, though, because then we get to Chapter 2. You know what I'm going to do? Um, uh, we're at the 120 mark, so I'm going to take a break. Then I'll come back and I'll, I'll finish this out. All right, I'm back. Let's close this out. So um, we've got the we've got it open here. So we've just got a few pages left. Uh, this is Ansible Tower. Ansible Tower is a commercially available, which means you have to pay for it, GUI-based playbook orchestration system that provides the ability to scale network automation solutions to even larger deployments role-based access control rbac playbook scheduling reporting and inventory management are all key components of ansible tower ansible tower can make the integration of ansible in the organization easier as it provides a more familiar gui based approach and uh includes some key components most organizations require such as rbac i don't know what that is uh, reporting and playbook uh, scheduling uh, so um, Ansible Tower can also be integrated into the TFS CI slash CD pipeline an open source uh, version AWX uh, uh, is available. Awesome. I love that. Okay, there's so there's an open source version. Um, let's see what um, uh, So what is RBAC? RBAC stands for role-based access control in the context of Ansible Tower RBAC is a feature that allows administrators to set permissions and allocate specific roles to users based on their job responsibilities this cool. provides granular control over who can access what within the Ansible automation environment. For example, certain roles might only have permission to run playbooks but not edit them, while other roles might be granted full administrative access to create, modify, and execute playbooks. By utilizing RBAC, organizations can ensure that users only have the access they need to do their jobs, which enhances security and operational efficiency. Now, tying this back to your... Okay, so it's just it's just a role-based access control. So it's just like assigning different uh, privilege uh, privileges to different users, which you can do on box, but uh, apparently you can do it... Um, uh, with uh, user accounts uh, as well when it comes to like actually running Ansible. Okay, so let's try to close this out. Um, so more information on Ansible Tower can be found here. More information about AWX, which is what matters to me because it's the free version. Um, it can be found here. And I just want to look at this quick. I do need to get through this uh, fast, but uh, not uh, that fast. I've got plenty of time. Okay, so AWX by Red Hat controller. Yep. Okay, Red Hat's doing so. Open source, yeah, it's, it's just the philosophy. It's what these people believe in. Like, Okay, AWX and automation controller. Yeah, perfect. Oh, Sarah, how I, how can I get started? Oh, how can I get involved? You know what? You know the other thing I should be doing is in addition to following these people on um, link LinkedIn, I should be starring these uh, re repos. So I'm gonna star the AWX repo. But I should also be starring the other repos. So like anything that I see like a git link, I should be starring those repos. 
So like here, here we go. GitHub.com uh, for Jinja. Let's let's do that. So I'm gonna star these repos. I just think that's smart. All right. So that's the Jinja two uh, repo. Um. So the next one is the uh, YAML repo. Let's star that one as well. Uh, okay, I guess we can follow that. I don't know what that means. Um, okay, and then um, there, there's more. There's the Ansible repo. Because it's like what you pay attention to a lot of the time is what's shoved in front of your face. So like, you know, I'm trying to train the internet to shove things in front of my face that, you know, I'm happy to have seen and not that I hold my nose and say PU. And it's it's hard to do that a lot of the times. Okay, so I think I've got all the repos uh, for now. Um, so yeah, let's try to close this out. I think I was on page like 36 or so. Oh, I was on page uh, 40. All right, so now, now we're on to uh, source control. After a successful transition from a collection of configurations to code, source control needs to be implemented. The organization's development team likely has source control implemented, which can be leveraged along with best practices and processes for changes to source code. Source code is a vital component of the new uh, NDLC, oh, which which stands for um, uh, something development, oh, network development lifecycle for engineers and operations. So yeah, network development lifecycle is like, you know, it doesn't mean code. It's, it's a, you know, Cisco had one for like all the legacy approaches. So basically what we're doing in this book is we're reinventing the network development lifecycle to include things like source control. So source control is a vital component of the new network development lifecycle for uh, uh, network engineers and op operations. Treating the network as code implies strong source controls. Network configurations stored as code benefit greatly from these source controls as the given state of the network or individual components of the network is known at all times. Changes that are tracked using source control display the exact changes and pre-change slash post-change state of the network device's intended configuration. Strong source control means when problems occur on the network, answering the standard what changed question is extremely easy to figure out, which is wonderful because when that's a hard question, it's like, it, it's it's better to work in an environment where that is an easy question than a hard question. Now, if you're in a, like a really toxic environment where you're just gonna be accused, and, but like even that, like, you know, you want to say, you know, I'm not guilty because this proves that I'm not. So like, you know, the best environments to work on, in my opinion, are where this what changed by who, by who are like, it's really clear. And so Git, Git, Git is a free open source and distributed version, uh, version control system created by Linus uh, Tor, Torvalds in 2005. And you know what? Let's let's follow him as well. This is like a main guy I should be following. Any names in this book? You know, let's look them up on LinkedIn and let's let's follow them. Why not? Yeah, here he is. He lives in Oregon. 
Is that him? That doesn't look like him. Um, I guess it's him. I, I guess he lives in or Oregon. Um, yeah, this, uh, unless it's a fake account. I mean, there's... Looks like there's a lot of fake accounts. I mean, it doesn't look like him. Unless he just looks a lot different now. Or, or like, because he's smiling, he looks different. But, like, the eyebrows look quite a bit different. No, I guess they look the same. I mean, he's just making a different facial expression and not wearing his glasses. So I guess it looks like him. Um, so here's the others. These, these look more like, um, if not fake accounts, just people with the same name that aren't him. So yeah, I, I think I'll, I think it's worth a follow for this one. I don't know if this is exactly him or not, but um, uh, there's no activity either. But um, uh, yeah, I, I'll, I'm gonna follow him. There we go. Um, so continuing on, um, in 2005, for the development of the Linux kernel, consider get the glue that holds the network development lifecycle, lifecycle. <laughs> together tracking all changes to uh, files <laughs> using commits. These tracks changes are included in the history of all the um, get repositories and changes can be rolled back at any point in time. All right, so here's a big one, the Microsoft Team Foundation Server or TFS. Share code, track work, ship software is Microsoft's slogan for TFS. TFS is the integrated server suite of developer tools for professional teams. Providing advanced source code management, TFS covers the entire application lifecycle and can be used to develop automated builds and scheduled releases, thus creating the CI CD pipeline. TFS features include Work Center, code repositories, build, test, and release capabilities. TFS has native Git support and Ansible extensions are available in the Microsoft Marketplace. All right, and then work. TX, TFX has a dynamic work center for cross-team collaboration and item tracking. As uh, new changes, uh, feature requirements, or code refactoring needs arise, work items can be added to the board. Using this centralized repository, members of cross-functional teams can be assigned, track progress, or complete work items. Working branches can be created directly from these work items, allowing code development to begin immediately and then tracked for status. All right, so code. Repositories are kept under TFS code along with a file explorer, branch explorer, repository history, and pull request information. It is recommended to keep natural work environments in separate repositories, lab production and development. Branches are available for comparison and tracking versions. Pull requests have an entire workflow capability and are used to merge working branches into the master branch. RBAC, which I forget, and approval for pull requests into the master branch should be implemented. Um, the master branch should be protected in TFS, which stands for the integrated server of developer tools from Microsoft. Thus preventing direct development in this branch, further enforcing the strategy. So RBAC, I forget what that stands for. I'll look it up again. Role-based access control. So role-based access control and approvals for pull requests in the master branch should be implemented, which makes a lot of sense. You don't want um, someone, you know, that you're hiring for a specific purpose to just come in and make a bunch of uh, changes to something else. So like, you know, maybe maybe they do that, you know, on day one, uh, have a lot of valuable things to contribute, but, um, you know, then the things they were hired for aren't going to get done. All right, so continuous integration slash continuous delivery, CI slash CD. In the context of network automation, continuous integration, CI, and continuous delivery, CD, implies full network automation of tasks. 
This pipeline should be abstracted as an orchestrated chain of automated actions and events based on intent through the build test release cycle. CICD can be achieved. CI enables distributed software development across many teams. Small but frequent incremental changes are continuously integrated into the master branch. CD then automatically deploys these changes to the production network. All right, so build. A build is a software product in its final consumable form. While builds are not a necessary part of using Ansible for network automation, they can be used to perform CI slash CD. When creating a build in TFS, Ansible playbooks can be executed as tasks as part of the build. Network reconnaissance playbooks are completely harmless to execute automatically and can run every time a pull request merges code into the master branch. Pull requests can trigger automated builds, which in turn trigger Ansible playbooks. This is the CI in the CI slash CD uh, pipeline. Test. Automated testing can be triggered by the automated build. Builds can be deployed to test specific lab environments, a VIRL environment, viral environment, that's like the Cisco version of GNS3, or a Jenkins environment. I'm not sure what that means. Um, unlike software, which can be easily be tested in virtual environments depending on its environment network testing may not apply to network automation playbooks instead testing could be incorporated directly into an ansible playbook be aware of the automated testing tfs offers so here's cisco viral which is kind of like gns3 and then here's uh information about jenkins um i, I might ask the ai about this because like my understanding of of Jenkins was that it was TFS, essentially. But like, um, now this used to be Ask Jeeves. It used to be a competitor to like Google, and um, uh, it used to be a search engine. It used to be a competitor like Google and Yahoo, um, and like AOL. Um, but uh, it really found its niche. This is kind of a good. Um, a fun uh, successful story and like you know if you're up against competitors and like you know you're not winning the race like you know pivoting to an area where you can um you can do better like this is a, a really great uh example of that and it's kind of like what i'm trying to do too it's like you know sometimes it's about it's more important to like find your audience and like find your niche and like you know be in a like sometimes just just continuing to do what you've been doing doesn't make as much sense as like just adapting and evolving okay um so what we're gonna do is copy this and paste it into uh, the AI. And then we're gonna ask it the question. I thought Jenkins environments were more like TFS, where they're for like things like CI, CD, like checking in code into a repository and like implementing it from there. I thought it was not really the same as like a VIRL environment for like having a lab environment and doing testing is my understanding of jenkins completely wrong your understanding of jenkins is generally correct it's primarily a cd continuous integration continuous deployment tool jenkins automates parts of the software development process and is commonly used to automate tasks such as building code running tests and deploying applications it is not designed to function as a virtual lab environment for networking tasks like cisco's Perl, virtual internet routing lab or other similar platforms would be However, Jenkins can be integrated into a more comprehensive DevOps pipeline that includes virtual lab environments for testing. In such a case, Jenkins can trigger tests to be run in a Perl environment, for instance, after a code build completes. So while Jenkins and Perl serve different purposes, they can be complementary in a full end-to-end -end DevOps workflow. Since you're aiming for mastery in network automation, understanding Jenkins could be quite beneficial. See, CD pipelines are becoming increasingly relevant in network automation, allowing for automated testing and deployment of network configurations, much like software deployments. 
Understanding how to integrate CCD tools like Jenkins with network simulation environments could offer you the bird's eye view of the industry you're seeking, enhancing your remote work prospects. Okay, so yeah, that looks good. Um, so moving on. Uh, next is going to be release. Releasing software, in this case network configurations, is driven by Ansible playbooks as the final step in the CI slash CD pipeline. Builds can be scheduled or triggered by pull requests. Ansible playbooks can be built into the release steps in TFS. While highly exciting, automated releases should be carefully considered and performed with a full understanding of the impact of the change. Disruptive changes may require specifically coordinated releases while routine pre-approved changes can be continuously delivered in real time. Check mode, documentation playbooks, automated testing playbooks, and reviewing uh, commits in the pull requests are all validation steps and quality assurances used to ensure the CI-CD pipeline does not have unintended consequences. consequences. There can be a great reluctance to move to a full CI-CD pipeline with fully automated changes being made to the production network. After all, if great care is not taken in developing, testing, retesting, and documenting code, a mistake can be automated, possibly taking down the network. However, when successfully implemented, automation using a CI slash CD pipeline can transform an organization's entire approach to designing and operating the enterprise network. This is a revolutionary opportunity. All right, so the summary. For years, enterprise class networks, um, and now there are also data center networks, there are also ISP networks. Um, uh, I think there's one more major kind of network. I can't remember. Uh, let, let's look at, I, sorry, I'm, I'm curious about this. Okay, so we've got um, data center, enterprise, uh, service provider, enterprise. And then like, these aren't, these aren't different kinds of networks necessarily. I mean, I, I guess a collaboration network is like a different kind of network because it's got like different kinds of devices on it, like different kinds of traffic running through the devices. So like you pretty much have to have it Oh yeah, so this is this is like the new VoIP. Oh yeah, and this is all see Okay, that's that makes sense. This is all like VoIP stuff. So yeah, that's just basically like a different kind of network in a way. A VoIP network, you're gonna have different kinds of traffic, uh, so different kinds of like QoS and stuff. You can basically think of it as like a whole different kind of network. But I mean, the thing is, like a VoIP network is typically an enterprise network. It's not like you know, a data center or a service provider network are like, you know, like they're typically not having like IP phones on them. So like VoIP network, in my opinion, is an enterprise network. But for years, enterprise class networks have been waiting for a scalable solution to basic network configuration management. Networks continue to be the bottleneck in IT service delivery and the root cause of many outages and downtime, partly because of the lack of management tools available. Networks continue to require large specialized support teams and many lack relevant documentation. Networks have not evolved alongside the other moving parts of organizations. Software defined networking. Uh, also known as SDN, also known as still does nothing, <laughs> attempted to uh, segregate and se segregate and centralize the network control plane while leaving the data plane decentralized across the network. While this approach did not necessarily take hold and transform the industry, the idea of decoupling the networking planes and the and centralizing the management plane, has found great success using network automation. Network automation can be understood simply as the conversion of network configurations to software like application code 
using the tools, methodologies, and processes used by the software development discipline. Every aspect of the traditional enterprise network can be automated using a modern network development li nice, uh, life cycle. So that's NDLC, that's what that stands for. Powered by an automation engine, um, like uh, for example, Ansible. Ultimately, the goal is to reach a continuous integration slash continuous delivery CI CD pipeline. Code changes are made by developers using pull requests which merges code into the repository's master branch. A series of orchestrated automated tasks, such as change validation, documentation generation, and delivery to production is in turn kicked off. All right, and now we're on to um, chapter three, uh, which looks great, you know, why automate a wonderful, ah, it looks like we're even talking about things like Henry Ford, which, um, you know, maybe he even talks about John Henry in this. That would be awesome. But, uh, yep, that's it for this video. Stay tuned for the next one where we start Chapter 2.